This video is on the restorative portion of the CDCA. So when you're working with your type of don, you're going to notice that the contacts are very tight. One of the easiest ways to get around that is going to be by wedging, pre-wedging before you get your matrix or your rubber dam in. So if you look right here, contact is too tight for the mylar strip. So you can just take a micro brush or you can take a wedge. A micro brush is easy because you can shove it in really fast, then take it out really fast. So you just create a little bit of space, get that micro brush in there, and then you can pull it out. And now it's nice and nice and tight, locked in. When you're getting the rubber dam on there, it can get a little frustrating because the contacts are so tight. You may not be able to get your micro brush in there underneath the rubber dam every time, or it's just kind of a pain. So if you have a fingernail, a thick fingernail, you can just shove it in between the teeth, create a little separation, and that'll help the rubber dam pop down. Unfortunately, I returned my rubber dam cassette, and I can't punch a rubber dam, so I can't demonstrate it, but basically you take your thumb, shove it in your proximal, where you're pulling down on the rubber dam, you create a little separation and it'll just pop right in. If you don't have fingernails or and if you don't have time to use a micro brush, you can use your plastic instrument, but it's not recommended because you can bend it. You just put it right in between, make sure it stays perpendicular to the gingiva because you don't wanna be bending it either direction. And then you can put a little pressure, create that separation and then pop the rubber dam in. For the anteriors, I basically just went from premolar to premolar and put clamps on both sides. It's unnecessary, but I just liked having the extra space to work so I didn't have to push my mirror against everything. It just kind of had its own little um, space from the clamps. When working on the anterior portion, you know, obviously you're going to have to know your measurements for the centrals, make sure that you are 1.5 from the DEJ. For the laterals, you know, as of 2022, you're 1.25 from the cavo surface margin. Sometimes the DEJ can be kind of hard to see, so if you wet it a little bit and then dry it just a little bit so it's kind of wet inside, it'll make it easier to see the DEJ. And that DEJ is just gonna be that, um, you know, the enamel looking spot before the dentin. When you're making your interproximal contacts and you're trying to figure out, you know, if there's enough space, remember that you can have closed contacts. You know, just always confirm on your manual, but you can have a closed contact. And the benefit of keeping a contact closed, even though it's gonna be more difficult to get a matrix in, is that you're guaranteed to have a closed contact when they look at it. When the CDCA examiners look at your typodont, they're gonna, you know, do something crazy. They're gonna take it out and hold it up to the light and see if there's light passing through. And that's not something we usually do, but you can use your mirror to kind of shine light through there and see if you have uh, open contact because it has to be visibly closed. So if you can create your prep without breaking a contact, then you automatically know you have contact. So this isn't the right matrix, but see, this posterior contact is still closed. In order to get this in here, I'd have to pre-wedge, drag it down. Let's grab a matrix. So we'd have to pre-wedge a little bit. Get your matrix in. and then pull it down. 
and then you put your matrix, you put your wedge back in. The benefit of this, like I said earlier, is to make sure you have that closed contact. Kind of takes the guesswork out of it, and um, pretty much guarantees you have a closed contact. I, I can't see any failures for this method, other than you know maybe having a open margin underneath, but your contact will be solid. couple of tips as far as um, making your boxes nice and square a lot of times we like to use the enamel hatchets if you, you it's these teeth are very brittle and it's very easy for them to just fracture especially on exam day so if you're gonna use your enamel hatchet make sure you use very light pressure and just kind of slowly shave it down don't you know do the traditional drop it in there and you hear that satisfying chunk sound you have to go very slow so don't go make a loud noise put a lot of pressure then you can just snap off that enamel because I, mean, I guess you could but you might take you know some of the tooth with it just because they're not real for the enamel on these teeth I've noticed that the diamonds work a lot better and honestly I would just watch the Stevenson Dental Solution videos for prep design because that'll pretty much teach you everything you need to know. The guy's videos are great. And he also sells the diamond burrs, so that makes it easy too. The diamonds, the 30 diamonds, and the longer diamond, I can't remember the name is, look just like this. So you would just use that, go along the occlusal, use the longer one to drop the box. I like to use, I think it's an 836, I'll confirm later, but it's um, basically just a straight one millimeter long barrel diamond. And you just, once you make your initial prep, you can just stick it right inside and then you automatically guarantee you have one millimeter isthmus width. And the uh, important thing of having a wide enough isthmus is because if your isthmus is too small, you can't get your microbrush in there. And then it makes it harder to get the bond everywhere. I don't know how important that is, but I just like to make sure that I don't have any voids on the bottom and that I can pack everything in and I can get bond everywhere I need to because I don't want it for God knows why falling out on test day and you know getting screwed. So as far as uh, protecting the adjacent teeth, we're going to use the same things, you know, inter guards, fender wedges, wedge guards. So these are the fender wedges, you just pop them in between. And that way you don't hit the adjacent tooth when you're creating that box, since you're not going to be able to use your enamel hatchet or gingival margin trimmers as much as you'd like. You know, having one of these things can be a lifesaver. You can take a very pointy diamond to trim off those excess margins or the, uh, the enamel overhangs when you start getting that C shape. And oddly enough, if you use a air driven handpiece, since it has less torque, it's going to be harder for it to drive through the metal. So it's a little safer when you're trimming off the little enamel overhangs with the diamond if you're using an air driven because once you touch the metal, I mean, as long as you're not going at full speed, it'll usually stop and not go through. I mean, you can always just do it by hand and I'd say like 90% of our class was able to do it just, or 99% was able to do it just fine without having to use a whole bunch of tricks. but. I'm just paranoid, so I use whatever I can get my hands on. And then if you get really, you know, really stressed out, you can always just take a, take a small diamond and then just hand file that last little bit right off.
obviously you wouldn't do this on a real patient, but for the exam it would help. As far as finding caries, just um, you know, prep one tooth, find the cavity, and start looking for that stick. And you know, just like in a real person, you're gonna look for the stick. You're gonna listen, see if it makes it you know a screechy sound. And you're gonna feel if it's uh, soft when you drag your explorer across. So you can, you know, use all, pretty much all your senses except for smelling. Unfortunately, visual doesn't always work because it's going to be similar, similar color to the dentin. But if it's soft, you can kind of pick at it, and you'll start seeing a little bit of white stuff kind of flicking off of it, and that's a good idea. That it's something that you need to take out. Just remember to prep to the you know, just short of the maximum acceptable limits, because if you go over, you know, that's a sub. If you go too far, that's a def. I liked using, um, I had three different explorers just so I could make sure at least one of them was sharp. And so I would test every spot with one explorer, you know, poke everywhere really hard, grab the next explorer, feel everything, poke everything, take another explorer, feel everything, poke everything. And one, that forced me to just make sure I really checked every surface because I'm using three different explorers and probing forever. The other thing is that it, you know, use three different explorers, you have a better chance of having one that's super sharp and able to help you find those carries. As far as uh, making sure you have a closed and proximal contact, I really liked using the metal matrices because you're able to, well, one, I, I didn't like breaking the contact because it guaranteed that I had a close contact. But if I did have to break the close the um, contact because the carries went out too far uh, buccolingually, then metal matrices are great because you're able to burnish them against the adjacent tooth. They also are a little thinner than the plastic couple of things that also help is if you use a large enough wedge you can create separation with your wedge so when you oppose that matrix you have even more separation I use the V3 ring just because sometimes um, rings can be stretched out and you don't know which one you're gonna get unless you you know get a ring on you know, on your own, or you check the rings at the dispensary before you put them on your typodont. Just remember that since other students are using these rings and sometimes they just grab it and they just crank it wide open to get it onto a tooth, these are gonna start getting um, weaker. So you're not gonna have as much separation force. So you're more likely to have an open contact. So check your ring, make sure it's, you know, strong, it's closed. It doesn't look like it's, uh, and then when you feel it, see if it feels like all the other, other rings, the amount of separation force that you need in order to get it on. And ideally you don't wanna separate it, you know, you don't wanna crank it open too far, just barely enough to get it onto the tooth. That way it'll make the ring last longer. And then you're a little better, better off on um, not getting an open contact later. As far as um, finishing and polishing, just um, I like to use the very large round carbide, about 30,000, just to trim off the excess. And then you can just use brownie greenie. I like to use the Jiffy polishing system. So these were great. I feel like using um, this system gives you a pretty foolproof way of getting rid of most of the flash and then making it really shiny. I 
And then this burr block is overkill. I pretty much only used maybe one, two, three, four burrs to cut the prep, which is probably excessive to a lot of people. And then um, I use the large carbide, the smaller finishing carbide football, and then the Jiffy polishing system. If you're getting a lot of flash in approximately, you can always take a an approximal strip. I would cut it in half just so it's able to fit a little bit better under there and you're not gonna open up your contact. You can also use your 12 blade. Oh, no, you can use a 12 blade to kind of just uh, trim things off. You can also use this scaler and then just get in between and just scale any excess composite that you have. That's pretty much it for the preps. Just um, make sure you're able to get a closed contact, that you don't have an open margin, that when you check occlusion, you want to mostly be uh, you want to have either very light to no contact on the composite, which is not too hard since it's just going to be either a mesial or a distal in the occlusal. And most important thing is make sure you check for carries, check again, triple check, because that's, um, that's death if you miss it. If you're worried about opening up too wide, in approximately, you can always take a 0.7 or smaller millimeter pencil, and then you can just draw a line in between. And then you know the width between that spot is gonna be 0.7 or less. You can also take a condenser. There's a condenser in your kit. One side is one millimeter. Other side is 1.5 millimeters. If you can't pass this through, that means you are less than one millimeter. Of course, you know, the way they measure it is gonna be with a probe. So always make sure you measure with your probe because when you use your probe to measure, depending on how you angle it, you could make it appear like it's a little bit larger than one millimeter or, or smaller. So just a few things to be aware of. So a common problem is sometimes having an open margin. And let me see. And this is a pretty um, simple thing that we all learn, but sometimes, you know, people can forget. So make sure that you use some sort of uh, lubricant on your tools to not pull up the composite when you're packing it down. So I'll do a couple here. So say you put your flowable base and you've got your composite in your prep.
if you were to go and just pack straight with your instrument, because you have the flowable at the base, it's got a surfactant at the base of your prep. So when you pack, sometimes it'll just lift right off. It doesn't seem like it's doing on this one, but sometimes you can just lift it straight off. In order to avoid that, just put a little bond on your glove or on your instrument. Or you can use flowable too if you want to make sure that it doesn't turn yellow in the future. And then it makes it not stick at all. If you run into any trouble um, with finishing or filling, you know, just let me know and I will try and figure out, you know, a solution for you that, you know, fits your specific um, circumstance. But it's, uh, I feel like once you get past the prep, you're almost home free as long as you can get that close contact. So just be careful with that. One other thing is that um, when you are doing your anterior prep, or when you're doing your anterior fill, and you get your matrix in, you get your mylar strip in, you know, once again, common sense, and we learned this earlier, but it's just good to review. Always wedge from the lingual because it's gonna really close off that cervical portion of the mylar strip. And that'll help you get less flash. Yeah, best of luck.